What lurks behind this unassuming storefront in Cleveland, Ohio? It's the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. Welcome to the uh, Buckle Museum of Witchcraft Frankenstein Radio Control Room, where we have rented out some space in the warehouse at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, so we could broadcast from there for a while. Uh, blessed Beltane to all our viewers, and hey, if you could do me a favor, um, head over to our YouTube channel and uh, hit subscribe on our on the little thing, because uh, if I get 100 subscribers, then I could get a custom URL, which would make this so much more easy. Uh, slowly prepping for our reopening on May 19th. Um, we're going to be doing it where tours are one hours, one hour long, and, um, you know, you can just get the tickets on our website, bucklemuseum.org. Uh, let's see. Not sure when we're going to be able to do live events yet. But, um, you know, that's still a ways away, right? Uh, today's guest is Stephen Romano, a New York City art dealer who graciously loaned us, I think it was 34 William Mortensen photos last year. William Mortensen, one of the greatest esoteric artists of all time. He was a photographer. And talking to Stephen, we're going to find out all about esoteric art. So um, we're going to be tuning into his living room I went there last year, and it is wild. I think you're going to enjoy it. So, with uh, no further ado, Stephen, you there? I'm here. Welcome to the Buckle Museum, virtually. Hear How's me? it going? Can you hear yeah, me? I can hear you. I'm a little closer, though. All right. So, I see that you're wearing an Odd Fellows costume. <laughs> so, part of the collection, you know, little bits and pieces. Yeah, that's really, that's uh, wonderful. Of Amulet of Pazuzu. <laughs> that's very cool. So I'm glad to see that you're getting into it. Welcome. So who's our camera oh, person? Just a little correction. I'm in Brooklyn, not in New York City. Well, New York, Brooklyn is part of New York City, but uh, yes, we pride ourselves on in uh, being in the heart of Brooklyn here. All right. Well, my mistake. So No, no, no. <laughs> So what's going on there? What's that painting right behind you, Stephen? This is a piece by uh, one of my favorite artists. It's an artist who was born in uh, Dresden, Germany in uh, 1930. His name is Wolfgang Gross. He was part of the, he was actually a witness uh, to the Dresden bombings. I think they were in 1945 or something like that. And uh, it was absolutely a horrific event. The Allies, the American up here bombed the uh, city and what they did was they made like a fire tornado by bombing the outskirts and the uh, circulation of the uh, of the air or whatever you want to call it uh, caused like a fire tornado and incinerated people um so gross was Wolf wolfgang gross was extremely traumatized i think he was 15 years old when this happened uh traumatized him for life so this is actually called the, a painting called the kingdom of death and here he is here, right here. That's his self. Right. This over here, this is uh, Martin Luther, who was, uh, th there was a statue of Martin Luther in the uh, middle of the uh, And then come on up here. This is death, death itself wearing the Pope's crown. Uh, <clears throat> memento may remember me and then that's a cross there and he has the the cosmic egg or the globe over here and this is the uh, coat of arms of the city of uh, dresden over here we have the four horsemen of the apocalypse my daughter is Jordan is doing the the plagues? what's that is one of those four horsemen's plagues well what uh death which one would be plague what's that one that one's got the scales I don't know what this one has here, but. Wow, that's extraordinarily beautiful work. Now, well, this is the kind of thing that, you know, if it was in the Met, you know, people would be surrounding it. I think this is 
one of the greatest paintings ever made by anyone. Uh, it's authentic, you know, it's like, this is someone who actually suffered this trauma and uh, articulated his ordeal through, uh, through his art making process. So, and then over here we have another one. Uh, it's the same subject, it's Dresden, the Dresden bombings again, here's the flames and the city of Dresden up in flames. And this is death. Um, this is presumably Jesus Christ, but one of uh, Wolfgang Gross's masters, so to speak, was uh, Albrecht Dürer. So this is based on a self-portrait of uh, Albrecht Dürer. So it's Jesus Christ, or, sorry, Albrecht Dürer is Jesus Christ. Here's the body, the loaf of bread uh, with a spider on it and the, the blood, the glass of wine. And over here we have the title. Dresden. And then over here, I don't know if you're gonna be able to get in to show that one. I'm gonna go around. Yeah, sure. Jordan's going to go around and show you this other one, which we just acquired. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it all. Oh, wow. Here you go. Yeah, it's really beautiful. This wasn't, I don't think I had this when you were here. No, I don't recognize it. I definitely would have. That stands out. Yeah. And then swing around here, Jordan. My daughter, Jordan, is doing the camera work for us. <laughs> That's why it's. And then over here we have this masterpiece. Here, pull back a bit so you see the whole Oh, wow. Thing. Yeah, it's great, eh? It's actually quite large. Let me get in there and show you. No, <laughs> oh, I, sorry. I got, you can see how big it is, right? Yeah. It's another one I got at auction in Australia. So this would be the Virgin Mary. I can't remember what this thing is called. It's some kind of... Um, Joanne Evanstein from the Morbid Anatomy Museum told me what this was. I can't remember. It's some kind of uh, mystical form or that deals with cosmic consciousness. Over here, here's the angel. Um, here, get the head. Yeah. Beautiful. Get it a little close so you see how detailed this thing is. Like, get right up close to this. This here? Yeah. The patterning is just, the, the, the treatment of the, of the work is just incredible. And, Wolfgang Gross's uh, statement, so to speak, or his position was that an artist uh, has to take a, a political position. And most of his work was you know, about war because of his own trauma. But he said the artist has to have a sense of technical proficiency for his work to be read as credible. If the artist doesn't have that, then you know, people will look at the statement, but not necessarily, um, how do you say, not necessarily find it convincing. Here, look at this, look at the wise men. I mean, this very, it has a very eerie kind of Hieronymus Bosch feel to it, which was another one of uh, Cross's heroes. Here, check out the angels here. Here we go, and a little baby. Look at the little baby. Here we go. No. Yeah, that's great. Look at this angel up here, right? And yeah, the, these are uh, beautiful pieces. So, how did you discover Walter Gross? No, like, Wolfgang. Wolfgang Gross. Wolfgang, I'm sorry. Where did you come um, across his work the first time? Another artist friend of mine in Australia, Damien Michaels, who is a really great artist himself. His work is uh, mediumistic. Uh, he's a very successful artist in his own right. And uh, he actually knew Wolfgang Gross while he was alive. And he was one of the very few people who uh, championed him and supported him and perpetuated him. And, you know, if it hadn't, if it hadn't have been for Damien, and his, um, you know, support of this artist, the artist probably would have been, you know, in oblivion at this point and not, not known at all. But it was only since I started uh, collecting the work and showing it, I've shown it like it shows at the Morbid Anatomy, uh, the, the Port Hamilton Gatehouse at the Greenwood Cemetery. Pretty much every show we've done there, we've included a large scale Wolfgang Gross. I've shown Wolfgang Gross at the Scope Art Fair, you know, where you know, 10,000 people over the course of four days will see him and, you know, critics like uh, Anthony Hayden Guest really got off on the work. And this is only over the last maybe two and a half, three years that Gross has really had any kind of presence in, uh, in uh, North America. So, uh, so yeah, we have, you know, I have the most significant, oh, here's this one here. Holy shit. Almost forgot about that. This is his masterpiece called The Throne of Death. Here, let me take the phone. Okay. 
This one's called The Throne of Death. It's his masterpiece. It's just absolutely How exactly do you decide which one's the masterpiece, Stephen? Well, you know, you have to have a, uh, how do you say, you know, you have to have like a sense of his overall body of work. And Wolfgang Gross tried a lot of different things. He was a self-taught artist. He apprenticed with his uh, grandfather, who was a renowned artist in Italy. And, uh, you know, it's like, not everything, how do I say, you know, not everything he did was golden, right? A lot of them were like failed experiments, so to speak, right? So, um, pretty much every piece that you've shown us so far has been golden, in my opinion. This is from 2000, no, 1999, so it's a late work. He died in 2008. The story is actually really tragic. He, um, after World War II, he came back to Berlin, uh, when uh, East and West Berlin were separated. And he would have a sausage cart and he would go over to uh, East Berlin and sell sausages. And you know, the guards found this kind of strange one day and they searched him and they found uh, on his possession, a drawing he had made of Stalin on the gallows, uh, which was, you know, against the law. So they arrested him and uh, he was tried and uh, sentenced to death. Uh, and his sentence was excommunicated to, um, 25 years hard labor in a gulag where there are apparently 15,000 other men. So, uh, you still with me, brother? I am. Okay. Um, cause you, you shorted out there. Uh, so he spent eight years of the gulag in hard labor. And again, that was another traumatic experience to add, um, to the list. So when he came back, uh, after he was liberated and he came back, he worked as an illustrator for a while and, uh, you know, tried all kinds of different things. His work initially was more kind of German expressionism. Um, and then he, he, he turned to a style that was called uh, magic realism, which artists like Ernst Fuchs and I can't think who else, but, um, you know, it was a pop, it was a popular style, kind of fantastical art. Right. So this to me is his most complete work or his most uh, completely articulated work, this one and uh, The Kingdom of Death as well. So we're really excited to be presenting uh, Wolfgang Gross. These aren't works that, I'm, that we're selling right now. We're gonna try to perpetuate them and get them shown in museums and whatnot. Actually, there's one other one here. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but just an absolutely incredible artist. So he moved to uh, Tasmania in the late 60s. Uh, there was sort of like this exodus of Germans moving there because uh, of the social political upheaval there. And uh, this, you won't be able to see that well because of the reflections. Hang on, let me see if I can do it that way. Here, just hold that. This is called Death's Victory. And, uh, you know, he worked as an artist and was shown interna and internationally and, you know, the other side of the pond. And he, uh, his muse, his wife, his muse tragic, died tragically in a swimming accident. And uh, Wolfgang Gross died three days later of a broken heart. So his story is quite tragic, but uh, beautiful at the same time. Wow, those are incredible, Stephen. I know, they're amazing. Did you see this one in the flesh when you were here? Yes. Yeah. It's a showstopper, isn't it? It really is. It's, um, you know, the thing I love about his work is it's so hyper detailed and it's so jammed together that you can Here's spend like yeah. you could spend a, you know a lifetime just staring and revealing its mysteries and uh i think that's an important part of good art so steven i gotta ask you a personal question okay, let me just say one more thing about grass you know okay thing we all experience called life right and i don't want to get too philosophical here but it has to do with sort of the whole uh, thread of continuity, you know, within the collection and the art that, uh, you know, I share, you know, in art, in a or in life in a way is, is you know, it's, it's trauma. And I mean that kind of like as a value neutral statement. It's like, you know, things happen and we develop a subjective uh, uh, experience that we draw from when we come back and look at works of art. You know, we have a subjective interpretation of it and it feeds us uh, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually, in all these other ways. But there is a very small handful of artists who have had an authentic experience and 
their way of dealing or articulating with that trauma is through their art. They let the, they, they, they let the art speak um, for them and be um, not a representation of their trauma, but uh, an extension of it. So, um, you know, this is the art that we love and um, the art that we perpetuate. So part of the human psyche, I believe, uh, is hot wired to recognize that authenticity uh, when we see a work of art that uh, speaks to us, you know, in a way. And um, it's, it's an affirmation in a sense that uh, our seeking is uh, legitimate, that uh, we don't necessarily buy into the hegemony and we, um, you know, we, tr we try to find things that expand our experience and expand our consciousness and enrich, our, enrich the quality of our lives and uh, unify us as a species. So. It's all about soul and it's all about love. So, yeah. This one? Whatever. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt there, Steve. Oh, no. I just thought, I want to know, what was the first piece of esoteric art that you ever purchased? Hmm. Like, I feel like pretty much all art is esoteric in one nature or another, but what's the, the first time. piece all that the, you saw time. that you're like, this is the mysteries? What would have been? I think this might have been one of the first pieces here. This one here. This is uh, oh, a I love that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The this is called. Uh, this is known as the Venus of Detroit. That is so fantastic. Incredible piece of art. Here, I'll put my hand in there so you get some scale, some sense of the scale. So, with anonymous art, you know, it's somewhat uh, speculative. In ter you know, if there isn't provenance and there isn't. Uh, how do you say, you know, there isn't a record of what exactly it was. And, you know, so it's, it's shades of gray, of course, right? But um, this is widely believed to be uh, African-American uh, because of the stylization and uh, the, the, the geographic setting it was found in, which was uh, Detroit. Um, so it's believed to have been like a fertility figure that um, probably like a midwife would have given to troubles that were to uh, couples that were having trouble conceiving. They would go to the midwife and, you know, possibly ask, you know, for a magical spell to be put on them. And here, come around there like that. And they would be given this object, and it would be, you know, purportedly put over the bed while they were uh, trying to get trying to uh, conceive. Just an absolutely beautiful form, right? So one of the reasons why I love that so much is we have a mandrake uh, root here in the collection which is definitely a uh, fertil fertility totem. And, uh, you know, I can just, I see the lineage going back and back hundreds of years of uh, what's going on there. So very Absolutely. cool piece. When I first saw that at your place, I was immediately drawn to it. It's like a little handy, you know, it has so much power in it, right? And then- uh, So Stephen, we got some questions. Hey, come on over here. Let's just do this first here. So you're asking right. which first pieces of esoterica. So this is actually, you know, an absolutely incredible find. These are. Um, yeah, you know, these are cool. Yeah, these are. So what we think these are are magic poppets. So they were found in a uh, abandoned house in uh, Northern California, and uh, I acquired these through a very reputable. Uh, dealer named um, Joey Lynn and uh, if you look on Facebook for a page called Anonymous Works um, the guy's plugged into the main socket you know he's not like a big flashy art dealer with a gallery and all that he's just like he finds like um, absolutely incredible pieces and uh, I'm very privileged that he um, offers me these things so you know one day he offers me this and um, I had shown it to some uh, people that are far knowledgeable than me, and the uh, consensus was that these were actually magic magic poppets. So, not being a you know practitioner myself, you know I really love these for their aesthetic value. And uh, let's see here. So, the coven, or what do you want to call it, the group of uh, practitioners would make these in the likeness of the uh, entities or I guess demons that they were trying to conjure for whatever purpose, right? Be it like 
a sexual conquest or financial affluence or you know whatever right so um and i guess and they would make one in the likeness of themselves as well and uh, through ceremony they would empower these uh figures with specific tasks and uh after the ceremony they would wrap them up in cloth and put them in the little nooks and crannies of the uh, ceremonial space, which to my understanding, this is how this was found. Now, um, a little bit after I acquired these, another dealer, Randall Morris from the Cabin Morris Gallery, which if you don't know that gallery, you should. In my opinion, it's the best gallery in Manhattan. Uh, Cabin Morris, uh, Sherry Cabin and Randall Morris. Um, so he had these three and um, his story was a little different. He said that he had acquired these from the legendary dealer Spencer Throckmorton, and he thought they were some guy in a garage making animation. But you know, I don't, I don't know about that because, first of all, these aren't articulated, right? You can't really move these around, so you know, I don't know. And also, the hand gestures, you know, they seem very specific to, I don't know, some kind of occult practice or what do you think, man? Are you with us still? Oh yeah, no, I, I. See, this I don't like, see him as being part of an animation. I see him as being part of a cult ritual, but yeah, sure. They don't seem artistic to me, you know, in the sense that you know, they don't. Uh, they seem more. Um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Itinerant. They seem more itinerant. They seem like they were made like they seem like folk art. Like they were made by someone who had no artistic intent or no artistic training and you know almost um in any case they're very powerful they're a very powerful group i don't know of another group of puppets like this so and these are going to be in a show actually in um i think it's in minneapolis minneapolis museum i'll update you on that but in uh, february a curator is doing a show of uh, american art american art that deals with the paranormal so Cool. Oh, and that's in Minneapolis. Okay, Very you cool. got some questions? Fire away. Yeah, well, let's see. Um, Eric Freeman. Uh, oh, do we know? Says, hi, Stephen Romano, and also, hi, Stephen Intermill. Um, Eric owns like this Eric. place here, the House of Wills. So, hi, Eric. Um, let's see. He says, such incredible detail. Well, he's talking about the gross pieces, and I have to agree. Jillian wants to know where and how does he sell his work? So where can people buy art from you, Stephen? Oh, just go to my website, romanoart.com. Romanoart.com. And every once in a while, you, you'll do like a Just show. An like, Let's see if we can work out. <laughs> um, and also, uh, every once in a while, you do the big art fairs. You just did one, um, uh, the Scope show, right? Which was That's it? Right. It was kind of a recycling of the one that we did here at the Buckland Museum. The well, uh, yeah, so many people yeah. telling me, you know, we did that William Mortensen show, witches, at the Buckland yeah, Museum, which was, which was fantastic. I think, in my mind, it was the best Mortensen show ever put on. So uh, many, many people were asking. These are just some of the William Mortensons here. Many people were asking, "Oh, you know, can you remount the show in New York?" And this was like the best opportunity to do it, right? Yeah, it was fantastic. I'll uh, I'll always be indebted to you, Stephen. Not at all, and the reverse is true. I'm indebted to you. It's a uh, extraordinary special experience. So, um, you want to talk a bit about William Mortensen? Well, Mortensen was born in uh, what was it, 1897, and died in 1965, and he was uh, in Utah and uh, was dating uh, Fay Ray's sister and uh, Faye Ray to come out to Hollywood to be in the cutie films. So uh, Mortensen was her chaperone. They came out to Hollywood together and uh, she was like, you know, an instant star, instant success pretty much. This is the quintessential Mortensen here called Ho Ho Off to the Sabbath. Um, and uh, you know, Mortensen hooked up with Cecil B. DeMille and, you know, some other directors and did the still photography for films and, you know, made his way uh, into being the most highly sought after and 
most acknowledged uh, photographer in Hollywood in his day. Uh, and his uh, process, he would invent his process, you know, to, to, to be able to execute his vision. So he was the first one to use uh, texture screens, you know, to, in, a, in, a, in a fully artistic way or in a fully realized way. And, uh, you know, wrote several books on the subject of uh, photography technique. Uh, until Scandal caught up with him um, because of his relationship with Fay Ray, and uh, he was black. He was blacklisted and excommunicated from uh, Hollywood, and so he, you know, he opened a studio and uh, school in uh, Laguna Beach, California, where he had some three thousand students over a period of uh, maybe ten years or so. Whoa, and, whoa. Uh, I want to get us kicked off. What's that? Uh, nothing. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm a huge fan of the work. So, yeah. So I have the largest collection of Mortensen. I mean, I'm told anyway, I have the largest collection of Mortensen, several hundred, uh, photographs. I've been collecting his work for, I don't know, 15 years or so. And, um, to me, he's uh, like Gross. He's one of the true visionaries. Where did you first hear of him? Um, let me see. But I used to run a gallery called Rico Moresca Gallery, which is an outsider art gallery. But they had a uh, small photography department, uh, which actually grew. Um, and uh, one of the shows that we did was uh, a William Mortensen show. And, you know, I wasn't. Are you, do you still see me? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I see it there. Okay. Um, so I kind of like dog-eared it to uh, say to myself, wow, man, when I get to do my own thing, I want to check this guy out better, you know? And uh, so the more I looked at his work and investigated it, the more I was seduced by it, you know, to the point where, you know, I was the fool that was obsessively buying all the William Mortensons. Mortensen had this ongoing feud with uh, Ansel Adams. Um, you know, in that time, in the 20s and early 30s, painting was uh, forsaking its role as the dominant um, narrative art form in pursuit of the more metaphysical, you know, the more spiritual, like Kandinsky and Clay and you know, we know all that. So uh, photography, which up until that point was considered a technical exercise or a technique, uh, was making its play to become the dominant narrative art form. And um, William Mortensen was what we call the pictorialist. You know, his whole philosophy and aesthetic, you know, was based on taking the same measures and the same... Um, criteria that we look at a painting and judge it aesthetically with uh, taking th that criteria and using it to uh, see photo using it to see photography. So um, Ansel Adams, you know, basically wished Mortensen dead and uh, called him the Antichrist of photography, which is, um, you know, which which stuck to this day. He's still, you know, basically known as that. But um, Well, you're getting the idea, right? Yeah, these are all really beautiful. So we just got a question here from Nick Nicholson Elliott asking, uh, asked Stephen about his theosophical screen prints. And I think he's probably talking about the um, uh, Helga Oba Frobe. Uh, what? No. Yeah, that's right. Who the hell knows how to pronounce that? Olga Frobe. Olga Frobe captain pieces, which we actually have a stack of on display here in the museum. So... Uh, uh, yeah, she was a um, she was a friend of Sigmund Freud's, an associate of Sigmund Freud's, and she had the uh, Theosophical Society. Okay. It, the things that are right at the door, those geometric prints. Just bring one. Um, she didn't really consider herself an artist. I think that those Jordan is going to get one. Uh, th those prints are basically considered to be spiritual exercises, in the same way that. Uh, Tantric painting is right. Okay, so here's Jordan with one of them. Here, yeah. 
Beast Cup, oh, right? the Grail. My favorite one. Yeah, do you have that one? I do. Good for you. And that was on the cover of probably my favorite occult book, the Voodoo Gnostic Workbook by yeah. Michael Bertio. Yeah. And um, never credited who the uh, piece was by. And then I was just stumbling around the internet one day and I found them on your website. And that's yeah, yeah. pretty much why we know I each other. I didn't know what they were either. And I had like acquired a whole lot of them. And um, it was only until this show at the uh, new museum here in New York called the, the, what was it called? The Collector or something like that. Can't remember the name of it. In any case, so they had all the originals from it. And um, yeah, it was really great. So we were able to identify uh, who the maker was. And uh, I had several of them. Those are pretty cool. This is a cool thing. This is um, this is a painting that's attributed to uh, Ray Harryhausen, who was the uh, stop motion animator. But it uh, came from his collection. Are you still with me? I don't see you, Brad. I am. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right. Yeah, this is pretty great. Eh? Yeah, that's. I got this in an auction in London. It was all music uh, paraphernalia and ephemera, and this was like a. I was waiting for one lot to come up, and I thought, oh, what's that? Thought, oh, that's really cool, man. So what was the lot that you were waiting for? Uh, well, I didn't get it. I think it was like a record, uh, like a gold record award for David Bowie or something like that. Either David Bowie or Queen. It was years ago. but It, w it went for several thousand more than I was expecting it to. This is another cool thing. This um, Mike Zone, who has uh, the show... And the shop Obscura was uh, out at a art market, outdoor art market one day and posted this painting on Facebook. And I was just like, oh my God, that's so great, right? I gotta have it. So he went back and bought it for me and uh, I've had it ever since. But then I posted it on Instagram and um, you know, I didn't know who it was by or anything. I thought it was just anonymous and um, there was a comment that, oh, my God, this is my worst nightmare that this painting is on the Internet. That's me. And it's a painting my mother made. So uh, apparently this was made by an elderly woman who had uh, some psychiatric trauma. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love it so I, much. Right? That's very Lovecraft, that one there, right? The Call of the Cthulhu. The Call of the Cthulhu? Is that Cthulhu? Cthulhu, yeah. My daughter, my 19-year-old daughter knows more about this than I do. I think it kind of looks like you, here's, so. Here's what? <laughs> it's the mustache, Stephen. Yeah, thanks. Here's a little gem. It's from uh, 1939. It's a German uh, anonymous watercolor. Pretty cool. Here's one that's always popular. This is from the uh, early 1900s from the Midwest. Yeah, I love that one. Devil and Dancer. You see it's got like texture, it's got like depth and all that's got texture. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah. It's not I, big. Uh, yeah, I'll show you how big it is with my hand in there. Yeah, the Mephistopheles there is something out. Yeah, for sure. something else. Here's like a pile of stuff. Here's a little dog. And uh, I have a pretty extensive collection, probably in the thousands, of uh, just vernacular snapshots. Just... Um, Something as a backing. A vernacular snapshots. I just get, you know, one after the next, right? And they usually, you know, for me, they if they have like kind of like a paranormal feel, the more the better. Not that they are, how do you say, you know, not that they are necessarily like photos of paranormal activity or paranormal events, but it's just sort of the everyday vernacular feel that I, you know, re really love. Usually they're just like uh, accidents, you know, camera, uh, accidents within the camera or whatever. But uh, so here's a beautiful little drawing by another artist that I love, Garcilio Lima, who was a uh, Brazilian surrealist. Um, he was active 
a little later than surrealism. He's active in the 70s and no, late, uh, early, to, mid to late 60s, 70s. And this is a piece that uh, was in an exhibition at the Met Museum here in New York. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. This What's is a going on there? Some kind of. And it was also, here, turn around. It was also at the Reina Sofia Museum in uh, Madrid. So, um, you know, since I've been handling the work, it's gotten a bit of attention. But another artist who is, uh, you know, basically, he fell into obscurity after his death. And um, I published a book on him and uh, showed him at art fairs, the Outsider Art Fair, at the Metro Show, and Scope, Pulse, you know, a bunch of different shows. And, you know, he's gotten some visibility. So this is a really cool thing. This is by uh, Jacques Collot, who is a French engraver. This is The Temptation of St. Anthony. This print is from, when was it from? 1665, I believe. Yeah, 1665. So and it's just phenomenal, right? It's just so great. So here's the demon that this guy here is what was later... Um, in the Faust book, let me see if I can find my Faust book here. Where's my Faust book? The Faust book. Oh, here it is, right here. Okay, so you got that, and then let's see if I can do this with one hand. Yeah, here, see, there it is there again. Later in the Johann Scheibel book of the Magica Naturalis, we assume. I think correctly. This is what the this is the original reference there. You following me on this? Oh, absolutely. I would say he definitely meets a description, right? Yeah, yeah. So this to me is one of the greatest works of all time. Also, I just absolutely love this. You could look at this for hours, you know, and see new things in it. Yeah, it's like <sighs> Part of the same tradition that uh, Gross eventually grew out of, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Just cram yep. as many weird images as he possibly can per square inch. Horror vacui. I get the Baroque term is horror vacui. But um, I think both were, you know, obviously very influenced by the uh, Hieronymus Bosch paintings, which. Um, you know, it's an understatement yeah. to say that they're, ha they're uh, an important part of our household. So, I mean, how great is this, right? Yeah. But that, that's the great thing about having this stuff, you know, is to be able to share it. Yeah, that's, uh, um, I got to say, going over to your place and hanging out and seeing this stuff in real life was a real joy. Then we have all the Delshaws, who, uh, you know, I'm very privileged to be representing this work in, uh, what year was it, 2015 or 2014 or so? We made this book on Delshaw, this large, large coffee table book, which was a labor of love, and uh, the great writer uh thomas mcevilly who wrote you know he was the uh editor i think the editor the um features editor of art forum magazine and he took that magazine out of obscurity and basically made it one of the great you know magazines of our time uh this was his last published essay before he passed away thomas was a good friend of mine so that's special and then for the first time ever, we had discovered these early works of Delshaw's, and um, they were they were illustrated. So, so the whole book is the, the body, you know, selections from his body of work. You know, probably one percent of what Delshaw actually produced. But uh, so these were all made uh, late 1800s, like 1898, 1899, um, through maybe 1823. No, it's, sorry, he died in uh, 1923, so he was born in 1830. Uh, and they're just absolutely fantastic. And they tell the story of this uh, group of, um, 
uh, people who were in the Sonora Desert as uh, prospectors, but they also had this uh, club called the Sonora Aero Club, and their mission was to design, and we speculate they also tried to build the very first navigatable aircraft. But what's really interesting about it is it has all these really kind of strange, surreal hermetic codes and writings and... Um, you know, we don't know if this club actually ever existed or if it was like a fictionalization that uh, the artist made up um, for his spare time, or if he was making like a cipher, which were really popular at the turn of the last century in the penny papers, you know, Edgar Allan Poe. But they're just fantastic, right? They're just so great. But uh, I handle all the available work by this artist. So this was a significant book that we put together on him. It's very fanciful work, very um, beautiful. So anyone who's interested in acquiring a Del Show should talk to me. There you go. Yeah, that stuff's fantastic. Yeah, it really is. It's like a mixture of uh, cross between like Jules Verne and uh, Rizzoli, you know, who's another uh, well-known Visionary artist. Now, what else we got in the pile here? Oh, here's some of my little chicken scratch scribbles. Right. I studied art, and uh, but I haven't really been doing much lately. Just little bits and pieces. Uh -huh. That's that guy, who is a Guatemalan uh, shaman's. Uh, prayer altar object. So these are all objects on his altar. Um, and he would be, you know, people would come to him for, can you see that okay, or is it? Uh, it's kind of backlit, but it like also has a nice aesthetic effect looking like that. <laughs> there we go. This is like a rubber skeleton. This to me is one of the greatest pieces of sculpture ever made. This guy here. I just love this. It has like a really kind of eerie, almost like a Twin Peaks feel to it, right? Owl. Got the owl, got the skull. Dull, so where'd you find that? Little mask. Oh, this was a uh, collector, philanthropist who lives in Florida. He's quite known. Uh, he's written books and on the subject of uh, South American and Guatemalan and Mexican uh, religious art. And he just contacted me out of the blue one day and asked me if I was interested in this. And yeah, of course I was. So, and then this is a uh, black preacher. Uh, the companion piece to this, this artist, to our knowledge, only ever made two. The other one is in the Chicago Art Institute. And this is an imp. And we don't know the origins of this, perhaps. I think it was found in upstate New York, but it's been speculated that this is possibly Brazilian. But definitely That's has a cool. strong sense of mystery. And over here is my little altar. So we were very saddened to hear today that the uh, last night. The, so this album I've had since I was 15 years old. No, wait a minute, 16 years old. The Raven by the Stranglers. This is one of the ones with the 3D cover. Yeah, it's one very of the cool. Of all time, and this is like my altar with all my protective amulets, so to speak. Right. But we were very saddened to hear the death of um, the keyboard player from the Stranglers who passed away yesterday of the uh, coronavirus. Yeah, RIP. It's uh, very sad. But I've had this on my altar for years. This yeah, it's uh, the original copy I had from uh, when I was younger. So that's a lenticular piece. That's really cool. It's, yeah. uh, you know, somebody was telling me the other day that they didn't think that anybody's really dying from the coronavirus. And I'm like, well... Dave Greenfield, <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, right. Huh. So, so here. Right along here. Here's some other cool stuff. This is, you know, I don't have a big collection of 
odd fellows or Masonic things, but I do have a few things. So this was the first piece I ever bought. This is a banner from um, mid to late 1800s. I think it has Midwestern origins, but you know, you see the three links and the all seeing eye and the skull and the sickle, um, all the essential components, but it's very, you know, very worn. As you can see, a beautiful thing still has its tassels, but uh, you know, highly symbolic for me. And then I had this pedestal, which I acquired from um, another collector dealer, Justin Enger, and uh, I think he's in the Midwest also, but uh, another guy, collector should know that just somehow manages to, uh, you know, acquire these really beautiful pieces and, uh, you know, likes to keep, like him, like myself, he likes to keep this collection dynamic, you know, keep the pieces moving around and flowing and new pieces in, old pieces out and that. So this is absolutely beautiful pedestal from uh, an odd fellows lodge uh, in the Midwest as well. This thing is fucking incredible. Okay. This is one of my favorite pieces. I bought this off a of JPEG, you know, someone just sent, Justin just sent me the picture and I kind of dug it and I thought, oh, it'd be pretty cool. And I was like, oh, why did I get this, right? And then when it, when it got here, I was like, oh my God, this thing is just incredible. Every time I walk by this, I get chills, you know? Here, can you hold the camera? Of course. So what this is, is they would use this in uh, the ceremonial uh, Masonic or Oddfellows funerals. It's a taxidermied bird. She's about 125, 135 years old. So the bird they would put in, you know, with the casket and the flowers and all, they would just embed the bird. And uh, the idea was that the bird, the dove, would take the, uh, take the soul to the transcendental trip up to the heavens. So um, just an absolutely beautiful thing. And the case is what we call tramp art. So it's like two different kind of art forms merging together. One of my favorite pieces. And then we yeah. have, hang on a sec, then we have, no, stay there. Okay. And then we have these Ark of the Covenant angels. Hand carved, again, uh, late 1800s. Those are amazing. Yeah, they're really beautiful. This is actually, you're asking me what the first pieces I ever bought. I think these might have been this, the banner, uh, the Venus of Detroit, and the poppets. Probably were the first things I ever bought. But these I got much, much earlier. Probably maybe 15 or 20 years ago from a dealer in the Midwest, Doug Taylor. So, Any idea of the origins of those? Uh, again, Midwest. That's all Midwestern, late 1800s. Well, look, the, um, this thing called the Ark of the Covenant, which was, uh, you know, they would contain, they would use it to, they would bring it in, it had handles, the angels were facing each other, and it was like a rectangular box, and inside it were the holy scriptures or whatever. Yeah, the remains of the Ten Commandments. Say a uh, receiver yeah. from God, right? This is a gem. This thing here is an absolute gem. This is a uh, Masonic birdhouse. Do they have to know a secret handshake to get in? <laughs> the birds, yeah. So here we have the T square, or the, the what do you call it? This, the, come on, what's the name of that tool? The square and the compass. Yeah, the square and the yeah. compass. The G that stands for girls. No, that stands for God or grand. Grand Grandmaster, or so yeah. I've never seen another Masonic birdhouse, but there she is. I'd say oh, girl. God. Eric says God. So God. we just had a yeah, Ted Hands popped from, uh, on. Midwestern collection. Uh, John Foster, who's uh, has a uh, what's the name of his website? I can't remember offhand, but he has an extensive collection of vernacular photography that tours and uh, he's very seminal writer and collector of outsider art and champion of all that and uh, this is i believe this was from a masonic lodge as well real antlers but just the form of the deer of the black stag is absolutely incredible okay so here is the 
how do you to call this? Like the cat's ass, I guess, right? So this is a uh, piece that was found in a lodge in Michigan. It was found in the 1950s. Pull back a bit. Actually, you know what? I'm going to move it over. Here. Yeah, the light. So here. Sorry. So this was found in a lodge, uh, an abandoned lodge, actually, in uh, Detroit, outside of Detroit, Michigan, in the 1950s. We don't know, actually, how old it really is. Um, I would say, judging by the paper on the back, probably early 1900s or so. In not looks like the early 1900s, but so the uh, speculation is such that this was that's an offshoot of the Odd Fellows called the Rebecca's, which is uh, here, yeah, called the Rebecca's, which is the female uh, equivalent to the uh, Odd Fellows. So here we have just this cast of the Venus de Milo, which was half by hand. Right, and uh, it's against this kind of red velvet, right? And then the frame is hand carved. So come and come and see the frame. Show a detail of the frame on its side. Oh wow! Yeah, like that. See? Okay, so I use this for a show that I did uh, last year, last October. It was a Twin Peaks tribute show. And then this is a drawing by Josh Stebbins, but it shows the uh, Judy Jude. No, you have to turn it. You have to go The season three. So this is mind blowing to me. The affinity between that and that, right? And there's also this whole scene in Twin Peaks where um, just stay on that. Uh, there's this whole scene in Twin Peaks under the lodge, and the Venus de Milo shows up, right? Seen from Twin Peaks, right? So, just the affinity between this and that. So, Stephen, you were glitching incredible. out there a bit. Could you go back to show the thing uh, on the screen? There we go. Oh, wow. So that's pretty cool. That was a pretty cool find. Okay. Where are you? <laughs> Where did you go? And then here, I'm going that penis. This one? Yeah. I need a. So I think this next one here is one for the real heads. This is. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, this, this is, is exciting. A, this is a painting by a guy named uh, Bert Schonder, who was. Uh, and who was Bert Schonder? Story. So he did the uh, paintings for the Roger Corman film, The uh, House of Usher. Oh yeah. That had Vincent Price in it, and uh, a couple of other. Who was he married to? He wasn't married to her actually. That, I was wrong oh. about that. He was he had a relationship with uh, Marjorie Cameron. After she uh, split from, uh, after her and Jack Parsons split up. So, Schoenberg had this thing in Laguna Beach, a cafe called the Cafe Frankenstein, which was like the epicenter of creativity in the uh, 50s and 60s. So, not he's not a well known artist. Ringo Starr actually owns the vast majority of his work. So, Schoenberg would take peyote and uh, go on these trips and paint. So this is all done under the influence of peyote. A really fascinating art. So this is called uh, Portrait of Edith, and then in brackets, I should have loved you better. So Eric's wondering if he did any night gallery uh, paintings. No, Bert Schoenberg, no, I don't think so. But good question. Yeah, it definitely gives off that vibe. For sure, right? So what else we got here? Back to 
my pile of stuff. So these are by Josh Stebbins, part of the Twin Peaks show that we did. There's one of Hawk. So we were supposed to actually restage this show at uh, Graceland for the 30th anniversary of the airing of the first episode of uh, Twin Peaks, Graceland in Memphis, you know, the home of Velvet. That's where the only official 30th anniversary celebration was going to be taking place. Um, but, you know, everyone's plans got fucked up by the virus and we're hoping yeah. to redo it in October, perhaps. But Josh Stebbins is actually one of my favorite artists. His work is uh, very sublime. This is a tribute to Mortensen in here. That is absolutely wild. Yeah, it's great. And then this is uh, one of my favorite. This is based on one of my favorite vernacular photographs. But to see Josh's work in the flesh, it's, um, you know, it's so beautifully executed. And, you know, he would have been, uh, you know, had he lived 200 years ago, he would have been like a master painter, right? Where's he based so on? Actually, I'm doing, uh, he lives in Enid, Oklahoma. Uh, very oh, okay. Um, maybe someday we'll do a show of his work at your gallery. Here is a uh, beautiful morning. Morning uh, photo, woman in mourning. We just did a show of these at Morbid Anatomy. This to me is the greatest uh, morning photo ever taken. It's huge. It's a painted photograph, right? You can see the hands, obviously a photo. And yeah, it's just so, it's just so amazing. It's almost like a Mortensen, right? Then I have these weird things, which have caused a little bit of controversy. It's okay, it never hurts. Uh, so these I acquired from a collector, not a collector of art, but a collector of, you know, occult ephemera in uh, England. And uh, he didn't really know the provenance of these things either, but. Oh, yeah, I, I love these. I think he said they were acquired. I can't remember exactly what he said, but that he just acquired them as a group. He, he came across them and found them as a group, right? Some people have said that they're fake, but. I don't know why would anybody fake this? Right? It looks like it's made it's painted on underwear or something. <laughs> All right. In my experience, when people fake things, they're like really clean and saleable and you know, kind of more quintessential. These things are a little more obscure and the material, you know, isn't it's not really ink. Someone told me it was like a plant-based medium. But they're really great. The paper is very old. You can tell by the paper that it's consistent really old but yeah these are really cool but we don't know who made them i've had someone someone who knows a lot more than i do says it's thought that they were made by the same hand that did the uh, clavis grimoire because a lot of the symbols are so you know who would fake something like that but they're i don't know i think they're pretty great yeah those are extraordinary yeah maybe someday they'll see the maybe someday they'll see the walls over in uh Cleveland. Yeah, you know, so is there a way to date those? Uh, the paper looks like it's like ledger book paper. Looks like it's, um, looks like it's like 1800s to me. You mean forensically? Is there a way to do it? Oh, I don't know. So well, Eric is saying that some of those definitely look like blood. And yeah. yeah. I mean, that was my thought too, right? Yeah, those are so cool. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the imagery is, is, you know, derived from art history, right? And, uh, you know, they're not necessarily original images. You know, we've been able to trace the precedent of some of these. And um, I think maybe they were like worked on over a period of decades, you know, little bits and pieces added to it, but don't know. Yeah, those are those are fantastic. So our friend Ted Hand busted on here and he said fun tour. He says my favorite Masonic tools are the hammer and sickle. And Ted is an expert on alchemy. So I was hoping maybe you'd share a couple of those books that you have. Um, if they're available. Because man, yeah, those sure. are a lot. You mean the uh, Jacob Bone books? Um not sure. 
the uh, the ones from like what the fifteen hundreds. I'm trying to think of what that would be. Uh, the planetarium, the uh, the hermetic books that uh, you can cavalierly toss around and say, you know how to hold a book, right? Hmm. Maybe it's these ones. That stack of things here. Here, hold this, Jordan. Because I'm about to run out of uh, power. Yeah. I didn't even know those were there. No, we've been hiding them. Hmm. They don't conjure anything too dangerous. I'm sure. It's always a danger. Yeah, what's it like to live in uh, the Stephen Romano gallery? No, it's wonderful. It's very wonderful. You get to see some of the cool stuff out there. What was that? You get to see some of the coolest art in the world just in oh, your yeah. living room. Do you think it's the big ones down there? The, the big ones in the... Oh, maybe. Here's a beautiful book. I don't know about alchemy. I don't really have any books that are specifically on alchemy, but I got this one, which is very old. This is like... Uh, I can't even remember. Yeah, that fits the bill. That's absolutely beautiful texture and i think this is actually the six from the 1600 but just the type you know the design of the typeface and the images and can we get a little closer on one of those plates oh there we go the, the ouroboros Zodiacs and oh wow yeah so this is like one of my favorite books because of the actual design of the typeface and the texture of the page and how it's been worn and the scale of it and the weight and the smell oh my god <laughs> it's like a beautiful thing right yeah that's like a straight up ninth gate book right there yeah yeah but here's a, here's a really great one this is oh. the um what the hell's this called again the ne Necronomicon. The Necronomicon, yes. Yeah. The Hieroglyphica. Here, I'll, let me yeah. try take this. Are we uh, oriented the right way here? Yeah, this works really well. Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is one of my favorite books of all time. It's by this guy, Romain de Hoog, who was just like an illustrator. You know, he was an aristocrat and um, in the Netherlands in the 1800s, and he... Um, you know, did maps and biblical pictures, and it was only after his death that um, it was discovered that he had worked for 25 years on this whole kind of history of the gods, right? The forbidden images, right? So, hey, Jordan, come here for a second. Yeah. Just kind of hold that down. Yeah, look at that. So these are all etchings, right? original etchings. I think just only maybe, I don't know, 100 copies of this book that oh, survived. Wow. Yeah, I have three of them. Here. Sit down. Yeah. Sorry. Here, put that down. Hold that down. Like the other page, too. Yeah. All right. Adam and Eve. It's like really highly detailed work, right? Yeah, these are extraordinary. Yeah, no, they're fantastic. Oh, look at this. And everything has like a uh, codex to it, right? That explains what it all is. But uh, so I have this website called uh, Lexicon Mag, Lexicon Mag, M A G dot com. And uh, I put all these up high resolution with the explanation of what all the ciphers mean, right? What the, what they represent, which is a project I just did. I had some time on my hands. What recently? quarantined and I thought yeah. geez what could I do that I've always wanted to do so yeah I put these online and uh just yesterday I I'm doing this artist in residence curator in residence for a website called Monster Brains which is yeah I want to talk community. to you about that I'm going to uh, so share it on my screen yesterday we yesterday we did the first ever high-res scans of the Le Pot Vendee 
Diablerie's. So, um, are you still with me? Yeah, I just switched oh, to uh, uh, switch the website here. These are uh, these are really cool. Yeah, they're fantastic. They're brilliant. They're genius. Yeah. So, so what's going on here. at Monster no. Brain, Stephen? Here's, so I'm going to do another one. Well, I'm going to do post every week. Well, uh, sorry, every day this week. It'll be my one week residency, but just real quick. These are the ones that they can't show there. These are the erotic Diableries. Can we show those here? I don't want to. Uh, sure. You know. Sure. I don't know. You've been banned from Facebook more than anybody I know. I know, right? These are from uh, 1823. I think we've evolved, right? These are like, this is art. Are you getting nervous? I don't want to get banned. Do you think they're going to shut us down? I don't know. <laughs> but these are great. This is a very rare copy of uh, the follow-up to the Diablerie. I'll not, I'll not show some of the more nasty ones. There so there you go. That's your treat for the day. So can I just go over a couple of things real quick here? Absolutely. Yeah. So I have a somewhat extensive collection of uh, esoteric erotic films. So you know the papas, right? Because you were discussing this with uh, Gary last week, this film, right? Yeah. So, Stephen, I think we got to wrap this up here. Um, we've gone over an hour uh really appreciate you showing time this time flies stuff. when you're having fun right yeah it really does um so where can people find out more about you steven it's from simon king of the witches how popular you, film yeah 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 and then just i'll show you one more thing here all right this is uh that piece there this is from 1900 from germany called Execution of a Witch. Sorry, wait a minute. Public Execution of a Witch. So oil on your hands. We don't condone here, but it's a great piece of art. Yeah, it's fantastic, right? All right. So just romanoart.com. That's my gallery website. I had a gallery space for a couple of years in Brooklyn. One in Dumbo and uh, one in uh, Bushwick. And... Um, I'm sure glad I don't have a gallery space right now in these times. So. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah. It's uh, the one thing that I've really enjoyed about this is I come to the museum every day and tinker and work on things. So that's uh, pretty much the only thing that really keeping me sane right now. Cause if I was cooped up in my house, I'd probably lose it. So Our, but, it's a great art salvation. Or, uh, but honestly, I'd rather be not paying rent right now. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, for sure. So, Stephen, thank you so thanks much for having taking me. Us. What? I said thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was a, uh, it's, it's a real honor to know you and real honor to, like, to uh, have you share your stuff with us. So, thank you. And, um, bye, Stephen. Let's Take see. Care. All right, so that was a lot of fun. I always enjoy uh, Stephen's insight into the art that he shares. It's uh, He's got an incredible crack catalog of some of the finest esoteric art out there. And uh, thank you very much, Stephen. And for everybody that tuned in, thanks for, uh, thanks for watching. Um, I, uh, I have a couple live streams lined up. I need to uh, work on dates. We're not really sure. But uh, keep your eyes on our Facebook, and uh, you'll find out when the next one is. And to everyone out there in live stream land, I got to say, stay witchy, my friends.